Okay. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today for the last part of our lecture series, Hard Times, Brexit and Turmoil in British Democracy. Many thanks to our partners from the universities of Rome, Bologna, Siena, and Enna for their support in this project. Thank you also for the attention of many students and scholarship holder of Erdnauer Foundation. In the last sessions, we could listen to exciting lectures about political conditions in Ukraine, in Italy, and in Iran. Today, appropriately for the coronation of King Charles, we will turn our attention to Great Britain after Brexit. The 2016 British referendum and the tough negotiations between Brussels and London have received a lot of media attention in recent years. But since the United Kingdom's official exit from the United uh, from the European Union in 2020, the topic has been more quiet. Today, we will discuss how Britain has changed economically, but also politically. In the last seven years, since 2016, the United Kingdom has had five, five prime ministers, the same number as Italy. Did democracy change with the Brexit? Many thanks to Mark Gilbert and to Christian Schnee for answering these and many other questions for us today. Once more, a very warm welcome to all our guests. Thank you. Um, I think it's my time, it's my turn. So, um, just a short introduction to remind that uh, today's is the last of all webinars dedicated to an analysis of the conflicts and crises that are afflicting the international context. In the three previous webinars, uh, we talked about the war in Ukraine, the um, populist nature of the current Italian government led by Giorgia Meloni. And finally, we talked about the rebellion of Iranian women against uh, uh, um, the Ayatollah's regime. Precisely because we are uh, drawing to a close, I would like to uh, mention that this initiative was realized thanks to um, the collaboration between the Conrad Adenauer Foundation and uh, the universities of Bologna and uh, Roma La Sapienza and Siena. Um, I would like to thank uh, uh, the director of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, Nino Galetti, and uh, for supporting this project. And uh, I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Michele Marchi, Massimo Bucarelli, and uh, Daniele Caviglia for their efforts over the last months to, to implement uh, this initiative. My gratitude, our gratitude also goes uh, uh, to, to Francesca uh, Tralti of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Um, having said that, uh, um, the topic we are addressing today, Brexit, may seem a little bit out of context, as it uh, apparently um, is not a current ongoing crisis. All of us know that the referendum that originated Brexit took place on June 2016. And uh, all of us know that uh, Britain exited the European Union on January 2020. It is more than three years ago. Um, however, it is quite clear, I think, that Brexit continues to uh, have very significant uh, effects and consequences uh, on the British political system, on the British party system, on the British economy, and uh, on the relationship between uh, um, the British citizens, the British uh, people, and their political institutions. No less important, um, Brexit, Britain's exit from the European Union, has had and still has important consequences for the European Union too. And I think that uh, these consequences uh, are perhaps uh, somewhat underestimated especially in the difficult and complicated times we are living in, marked by the current international disorder. Um, perhaps 
um, a European Union without Britain is even weaker and less equipped to deal with the many serious challenges posed by the international system. To talk about this uh, uh, issue, uh, we invited two distinguished uh, prominent scholars, Mark Gilbert and Christian Schnee. Uh, let me introduce them. Uh, Mark Gilbert is professor of history and international studies at the School of Advanced International uh, Studies in, uh, at the Johns Hopkins University in Bologna. Um, he has written extensively on the history of European integration, on the history of the Cold War, and uh, on the history of contemporary Italy. He is uh, currently writing a book, he has written a book on the dawn, the beginning of the Italian democracy, and if I'm not wrong, the book will be published on 2024. Uh, then the second speaker is Christian Schnee. He is senior lecturer and program director at the University of Greenwich, London. He began his career as a spokesperson for the Christian Democratic Party in Germany and served as director of government communications in the city state of Hamburg. <clears throat> As the chairman, chairman of this of this webinar, um, I have the intention to ask the two speakers three questions, each of which should answer in seven eight minutes. So you will have seven eight minutes uh, to answer to these three uh, questions. And uh, the first question is uh, how. Does Brexit, Brexit is an unprecedented event. Uh, uh, there is an exception, Greenland, uh, but I think it was a minor event. I, I um, excuse, I, I, I think that the, the Greenlandic can excuse me by saying that this was a minor event. And, and the question is, how does this, uh, uh, unprecedented event that is uh, the exit of a so important country, Great Britain. How does this event fit into the history of uh, relations between uh, Great Britain and, and Europe? And, uh, and uh, I ask first to Mark to, to give his answer to this, to this question. Mark, the floor is yours and thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction and the very kind introduction of all of you. Uh, I, I've been looking forward to this event. Um, it's a great honor to be speaking uh, to something organized by the Comrade Adenauer uh, Foundation. Um, how does Brexit fit into the history, the history of the relations between Britain and Europe? Well, there's a sense, isn't there? Some people would say it's typical. You know, the old joke about fog in the channel, Europe cut off, that this is an example of British insularity, that Brexit is an example of British insularity. Uh, except, of course, Britain has never really been insular towards Europe, um, historically speaking. Uh, I think also, the notion Britain's leaving the European Union was spun, to use the jargon, by Brexiters as being a major international event, which would lead to Britain becoming, inverted commas, global Britain, that Britain was somehow reclaiming its destiny. It appealed to the idea that Britain's destiny is as a world power. I've always found such language, such rhetoric, such formulation uh, to be no more than words. I think we need to look at facts and to look at uh, what nations actually do. Um, so I think first point, let's strip this of the rhetoric. Uh, Britain made a choice driven by public opinion for particular reasons, which we can talk about a little bit later, it doesn't strike me necessarily, I think, too much world historical 
uh, rhetoric has been uh, uh, attached to the event. In the context of the UK's role in DCEU, in the history of the relationship with Britain with the European project, to use Kiran Patel's term, uh, I think it's tempting to see Brexit as the last straw for a country that couldn't accept the underlying premise of European unity, uh, namely the creation of the supranational uh, polity in Europe. Uh, you know, there's this idea that Britain's always been the reluctant European. We didn't join in the 1950s. We, inverted commas, missed the bus. We then tried to sabotage the problem, the, the, the entire project with uh, the attempt to create a free trade association. Macmillan tried to get into Europe, but Britain wouldn't accept the common agricultural policy. We did eventually join in 1973, proceeded to hold a referendum, and then complain about, uh, complain endlessly about uh, uh, how much contributions we had to make, and then came along Margaret Thatcher, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you all know the story as well, or better than I do. Uh, but even that, I'm not sure, to be honest, uh, that Britain was the reluctant uh, European. I think, uh, I think if you look back at the story, uh, Britain was unquestionably an awkward partner, to use Stephen George's uh, formulation, but I think it was a partner. Uh, and what caused the uh, divergence was, I think, the acceleration in the pace of European integration in the 2000s, um, after in the early 2000s, after 2001, the creation of the Larkin. Uh, uh, process which led to the constitution and which ultimately led to the Lisbon Treaty uh, and the uh, and so what I'm trying to say is uh, let's not automatically assume that this was somehow Britain uh, re Britain Traditional didn't renege on Europe so much as Europe became perhaps something that a lot of British people couldn't accept. It's not quite the same thing. And I do think that these are elements that we need to take into account. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for your uh, short and exhaustive. Uh, answer to, to, to my question. And uh, now I give the floor to Christian Schnee. Uh, to, and uh, we are ready to hear your answer, Christian. I, I teach mainly American students who come to, to London for a semester abroad. And uh, they, they many of them choose or chose in the past years London because they thought it's such an exciting place. And that is not just the the nightlife there, it is also the headlines that the UK made and Brexit attracted a number of students who thought there is a lot going on and it's a rare subject for someone who teaches politics. Usually you have to explain to students why something is important and they struggle getting the point and here they approached us and said this must be important and we want to know. Um, so what is the relationship and why would a country choose to, to leave the um, uh, a, a common a common market, such a big common market, and I, I I tell them leave London, get get out of the the big city, take a train to Sheffield and Huddersfield and Doncaster and Sunderland, and and go to the pub and have a chat with people, and 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 at some point you may talk about traveling and destinations, and you may notice that people say this summer we plan to go to Europe. And the Americans are surprised looking at the map and uh, looking at their geography, they'd say, well, Britain is Europe, it's part of it. And, and yet the, the way it is phrased by, by many British is um, we, go, we go to Europe. I, you know, I, I think with sort of social sciences, the interesting thing is you can always argue it from two perspectives. And uh, the one perspective, I think, in the domestic debate in Britain is that um, the European Union changed into something that we had not expected and that we hadn't signed up to. Um, and others would say um, 
there's always been this fundamental resentment and skepticism and the fear of losing something because you make a choice. If you ally yourself with uh, one entity and that is a European, uh, the European community, then you'd, you'd lose your ties to somewhere else. So it had always been, if there were reluctance, it was the reluctance between um, very early on, there was an awareness of what one would give up. And if you look at the people in, in their days, not me interpreting them, but the people in their days, um, how they commented on the various options they had, uh, you'd see that that reluctance and that resentment in a wording you would now associate with far right groups uh, was prevalent throughout the, the major parties in, in British politics. And um, so I've, I've, I just for, to highlight and to, to, uh, uh, to illustrate that I've got uh, one or two or three for you and uh, Nigel Farage had been made at his uh, lifetime project to take the country out. Someone who's frowned upon among all major part, uh, mainstream parties in Europe and certainly the establishment in Brussels. Uh, he could uh, uh, take uh, some of the, uh, use some of them, recycle some of these quotes and make them his own. And, uh, they are from people who he would not naturally join UKIP or Brexit party or whatever it's called now. Um, and the, the thing started with British politicians after the war when, when Churchill talked of the United States of Europe and his uh, grandson, Nicholas Soames, uh, he says, uh, probably to defend uh, his, his grandfather's reputation, he says, well, Churchill meant, of course, that Britain would be part of a united Europe. Um, a contemporary in those days, uh, one of the architects of the uh, the, the fledgling community, Paul-Henri Spark, the Belgian politician, he said, at the time, um, all the time, Churchill appeared um, to to think of Great Britain as as part of Europe. But in fact, this is not the case. The United Europe, which Churchill advocated, was a continental Europe, um, and we would be friends of that continental Europe, but we'd not be part of it. And when Konrad Adenauer, which I think, given our host today, nicely fits in, he visited. Churchill and um, Churchill reassured Adenauer that um, Britain will always stand by the side of Europe. And Adenauer noted there's something funny in that formulation. He said, but Mr. Prime Minister, England, as he would call it, England is not by the side of Europe. It is part of um, Europe. Now, one could say, well, that's uh, you know, looking from sort of today's perspective, that is an ongoing issue the Conservatives have with uh, the, the the European integration. Only that is not the case for most of the time. So there is a red thread both in the Conservative and the Labour Party, the two major parties throughout the decades of, um, I, I would say not suspicion, but real resentment. So Ernest Bevan, a senior minister in the in the late 1940s cabinet and lab, uh, senior Labour politician. Um, he said in the early 50s, when the decision was on the table, should we join the, the Messina uh, preparatory meeting and then at Rome, he said no socialist party with a prospect of forming a government could accept a system by which important fields of national policy were surrendered to a supranational European representative authority since such an authority would have a permanent anti-socialist majority and would arouse the suspicion of European workers. Now, there was a domestic agenda, uh, a socialist domestic agenda at the time, and there were um, suspicions that um, a European authority would not go along. So that idea of we need to be sovereign and make our own decisions. Uh, that was something that just didn't pop up uh, and was generated by Brexiteers recently. But the, the resentments were much deeper than domestic, um, domestic policies in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. I think there were cultural resentments and they go back um, far, far longer and deeper. And I have a last quote, and I think that my seven minutes are up. I've got a last quote to just highlight the continuity, uh, continuity of these much deeper rooted cultural um, concerns. Um, James Gallagher, Prime Minister in the late 1970s, um, sort of center ground moderate politicians by today's standards uh, and, and leader of the, of the Labour Party, he in the 19, early 70s, when the top 
question to answer was, do we go into the European community? Um, Gallagher said at the time to the party conference, to enter the European community would be to exchange America to the common and the Commonwealth for an arena of European claustrophobic uh, phobia, which meant a complete rupture of our identity on the continent, this is not stand up comedy, that was a speech to party conference. On the continent, people speak foreign languages, especially the French. They speak French. The language of Chaucer, Milton, and Shakespeare will be challenged if we were to prove our Europeanism by accepting that French is the dominant language of the community. Then my answer is quite clear, and I say it in French in order to prevent misunderstanding. No, merci beaucoup. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, speakers can react to uh, um, the other uh, speakers. Yeah, I, I would love to react to. to yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I thought that was, it was really interesting to hear that. I mean, two comments spring to mind. The first point uh, is uh, if you want to understand the referendum in 2016, you absolutely had to get out of London. Uh, those of us who come from north of the Trent uh, or uh, are used to living in the, the rural parts of England or the uh, seaside towns of England um, have understood immediately that there was a real chance that the referendum might be lost. It, it really quite struck me living here in Italy, but not only uh, just reading newspaper commentary from around the world, which were clearly based on journalists, intellectuals, perhaps members of the European Commission who uh, had only really bothered to talk to other people rather like themselves within London. And there's no doubt at all, uh, you're quite right, that the uh, deep England, if you like, rural England in particular, uh, had never perhaps accepted the notion that Britain was somehow part of Europe. I do think, however, that politically Britain did accept uh, Europe. I mean, all those quotations and discussion, what happened in the immediate post-war period are, of course, accurate, and you could quote a lot of other things too. Uh, but sometime in the 1960s, I think it really does go back to Macmillan and his grand design, the Conservative Party in particular, but not only, decided that it was absolutely essential for Britain to be part of Europe, in part because it wanted to retain its uh, status as a great power, in part because its economy was uh, suffering by comparison with its European neighbours, in part because, um, I think, quite frankly, they needed a plan. They needed to have something which would make their policies hang together in the Britain that was changing. And... Uh, being part of inverted commas, the common market seemed like a rather uh, useful way of modernizing the country and retaining its position in the world. That project, I think, did on the whole command the leadership, uh, did command the approval of the what you might describe as the establishment in Britain until well into the 1990s. And it was what happened subsequently. What's happened subsequently is we've had a breakdown uh, in the consensus in the uh, establishment. And this has been magnified by the popular press, which has been largely uh, Brexit or uh, was Eurosceptic and became something of a national question. It is brought it's, it's added to a whole wealth of issues which were already simmering inside the British polity. And I, so I think one has to see Britain's membership of the European community as being something that British elites, by and large, uh, supported for all kinds of really rather good reasons connected to British foreign policy and economic policy. Consensus broke down on this issue. Now, there was never consensus to beginning. If one looks at the early, uh, the campaign slogan of the anti-marketeers in 1975, the slogan is uh, Britain into the world, right? It's global Britain. I mean, nothing changes. You can go back and read Enoch Powell. You can go back and read Douglas Jay. You can go back and read Peter Shaw. You can go back and read uh, Angus Maud. 
these people are saying almost identical things to what was said in 2016, uh, only they, they were saying it, shall we say, in a rather intellectual way, putting a big emphasis on the doctrine of sovereignty. It was a minority opinion. Public opinion generally felt that, uh, that the elites were right, that it was part of Britain's plan to modernize itself, Britain's way of keeping itself in the world. The referendum, in fact, won by an overwhelming majority in 1975, 67 to 33. It's what happens in the early 2000s, I think, that causes a shift in public opinion. And, and this is also uh, accentuated by the absolute hostility of uh, the British tabloid press. In effect, what you have is the ideas of someone like Enoch Powell from the 1970s go mainstream. And they go mainstream as a result of the press. Uh, in a time in which there were lots of genuine social issues within Britain, and I think Brexit became a kind of talismanic issue as a result. Uh, excuse me, rather a long intervention there, but I, I, it is something I obviously feel quite strongly about and have had to live through. No, no, it was very interesting. Christian, do you want to intervene? No, no, perfectly fine. Thank you. Okay, so but don't you think that we need to stress the difference between uh, Englishness and Britishness to understand uh, the British attitude or English attitude towards the European integration process? I, I would, I would leave that. I would leave that uh, perhaps for, for Mark to comment, <laughs> to comment on that. <laughs> and here I really could talk for hours and hours because, of course, one. Of <laughs> things which has been happening in Britain. It always amuses me when people in Italy talk about Britain as being a stable country compared to, to, uh, to, compared to Italy. Uh, in addition to the Brexit culture war that we've had, uh, and given you know, the Irish actual war only stopped in 1998, we've also been assisting at the breakup of the United Kingdom over the last 30 years. I mean, all these things are going on simultaneously, not to mention uh, uh, changes uh, to the sort of basic parliamentary form of democracy, the, the tone of parliamentary democracy, which of course are not limited to Britain alone. And also I think Englishness is also an interesting concept because uh, what is Englishness? I think it's actually quite interesting to see somebody mentioned, I think it was Mr. Galletti, mentioned King Charles's uh, uh, coronation and here we had something, there you have the pomp, the ceremony, the embodiment of what everybody in continental Europe thinks of as Englishness and unquestionably did appeal to a very large audience. The Liverpool football team, football supporters, uh, sang a chant to the effect that they could put the coronation in a distinctly delicate part of one's anatomy the same evening. Uh, on the grounds that what has the British state done for us, the deprived parts of Northern England? And you could find that sentiment actually in rather a lot of areas of Northern England. It's not actually a surprise that uh, in the 2019 election, the Conservatives won, in effect, uh, because they were able to... I grew up in the... Uh, my, my family grew up in the <coughs> North Coalfield. Mansfield, which is at the heart of the Nottinghamshire coalfield, was won by a Conservative in the last election. If somebody had told me that was ever going to happen, I would not have believed it. And it happened because, uh, because of Brexit, because lots of working class people were sending an anti-establishment message. Uh, you can't take away this notion of anti-establishment uh, Insofar as membership of the European Union was a signature policy of the British establishment, Brexit is a rebellion against the establishment. And yet the enormous paradox is it, the Brexit campaign was led by people who are caricaturally English, inverted commas, upper class. And if somebody can explain that to me, then uh, they have a better understanding of English than England than I do because I can't. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, now we move to the second question. Um, and I would like to hear from you your assessment 
um, about, on the impact of Brexit on the British political and party system. Um, Christian, do you want to give your answer? It's it's uh, it disappeared from uh, from the party agendas for different reasons. So it's there. It's big. Probably I don't know whether it's the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. Well, the Conservatives are looking at the opinion polls. They realize that people are uh, the majority of uh, uh, people asked wow. by the um, pollsters are very unhappy with how Brexit was managed. I think that's the term they use now instead of saying it, it was it was all wrong. Uh, they'd say it's poorly managed, so there's still sort of the the option. Perhaps in the long run, it's good, but it's poorly managed. Um, so they're not happy with the current government's uh, handling of it, if not the whole project. Um, the Conservatives are responsible for it and will be forever. So they they rather not. They turn to other issues. So when. Uh, when Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister earlier this year, he had his five pledges he wants to be judged by when um, then uh, the, 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 the election uh, is, is on the agenda, on the horizon, then um, Brexit is not one of them. He wants to you know, grow the economy and he wants to stop the people on the small boats crossing the channel and he wants to half inflation, but it, 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 Brexit is not. Now, the Labour Party doesn't want to talk about Brexit because they're terrified by the whole idea. In 2019, was Brexit more than anything else? So that that made them uh, lose the election and uh, not just lose, but be trounced and uh, utterly so reduced uh, in historical terms. And uh, the um, the Lib Dems, uh, well, they didn't get much. Uh, you know, out of that election and the argument as the only party that wanted to remain either. And then. Um, so, so they've been suffering a lot. So there's none of the major parties that wants to talk about uh, Brexit, and therefore it is currently, say, the fallout, the management of it, the 14 hours you know, school children a few weeks ago had to wait at Dover to get on the on the ferries and then for their school trip to southern France, um, the French uh, uh, border guards that now very diligently check passports and uh, sort of they need to build on the, on the UK side extra. Uh, um, car parks for the trucks and there are many trucks drivers who don't even want to do the crossing because they say i don't want to sit there for hours in my truck uh, i i published a book last year on, on the uk and i tried to send it to reviewers on the continent and i realized after some time they wouldn't get it because it was stick, stuck at customs and they were then notified there's a parcel waiting for you do you want it and then it was sent back most of them were sent back so you realize even a, a parcel because customs was asking what's the value of the parcel what's the content of the parcel questions we you know, growing up in Germany, sending things across the border to France and to, to Italy was never on my mind. Now, now, now it is. So um, it, it's there, and it's a it's a it's a non-subject. It's there, not not discussed. Uh, now, what's the impact? Um, well, the, the the impact's always to do with people and to do with. Um, with the context and and the the, the, the the people is a very un, un, unhappy sequence of of prime ministers since David Cameron that were made huge mistakes were ineffective were incompetent were dangerous and that was a really unusual combination so David Cameron calling feeling under pressure and thinking he had to call that referendum. Uh, without, without any safeguards, you know, you could have set up a referendum with different rules and you would have easily won it had you said, I want all the nations of Britain to agree for constitutional change, you would not have had Brexit. And I suppose the Brexiteers would have had been happy to have a referendum at all. They would not have quibbled over the um, the, the, the the various conditions applied to it. Um, so you, you, you have, uh, and the, the second one is the context, and the context is... Uh, we we don't have a we don't have a written sort of fixed in writing constitution that settles and and defines the um, the various sort of institutions of of our of our government and therefore it relies on something that Peter Hennessy called um, the good chaps that is people that respect the constitutional conventions and it all goes by conventions and common law and statute law so people who don't want to upset the constitutional structure now if you have a money key and struggle good between evil as Brexit turned into um, you feel you have a, a, a moral right to do whatever it takes 
to make the right side, which you believe is you, is win. And if you have a populist party in government that claims to define what is right, uh, then uh, they, they, they ask themselves the question, well, if the constitutional court is now away to leading this country to its destiny, which we defined, well, the constitutional court would have to be reformed. We, would, we were at the point of having a very similar discussion to what the Israel is going through now. Um, um, if, if the... Um, if you have a parliament, and that was really the the, the sort of the high or the low point of parliamentary democracy, if parliament is uh, obstructing an oven ready deal with the European Union that takes us out of that union and and fulfills the wish of the people, which we defined, um, then parliament is an obstruction, and we uh, prorogue parliament or we send MPs home, and we don't have the discussion for a couple of weeks. Um, and yes, it is defined by the populist conservative party uh, uh, because a, a, a sort of a hard Brexit was not what people voted for. Perhaps it was, but it's the conservatives who defined what kind of relationship we have. And anyone who was sort of having putting up their arm and say, well, perhaps we'd need something that recognizes the 48% that didn't like the idea, they were being defined by the media as traitors and by the, the hardcore conservatives. Now, uh, yeah, I fully agree with Mark. So a large part of the Conservative Party for economic reasons thought it's a it's a very good idea to be part of a common market. Um, and Mrs. Thatcher was in favor because she thought that would shake up the sluggish British industry and would sort of you know, be a makeover of management and make them more effective. Um, but there, there had been a growing, as a legacy of Mrs. Thatcher, there had been a growing groundswell of anti-European uh, uh, sort of pushback in the Conservative Party, and that had been growing. And the pragmatic pro-European majority of the party, that did something which Ken Clark, former chancellor, compared to feeding bread rolls to crocodiles. Imagine you sit on a boat and you're sort of you know, followed by the crocodiles and you make concessions to them just to keep them at arm's length and you feed bread rolls to them and they ask for more and more. So you gave them opt-outs in that European treaties. The Brits asked for opt-outs in order to satisfy their anti-European um, base and their anti-European um, um, faction of the Conservative Party. At some point, the only thing they could get was the referendum. And then the very last thing was a hard Brexit. And uh, uh, that is something uh, which I think is the legacy. Um, there's, um, there's much more to say, but it's really the combination of you have a con convention, a constitution that requires good behavior of everyone involved, everyone who operates in the public theater. And you have a on the Brexit area, on the Brexit area, a much more populist, radical, extreme conservative party, and those things clashed in 2018 and 19. And this is, I think, why initially this, you know, that the, the headline for this talk was about is there risk to British democracy. In 2019, there was actual talk about is there risk, because the um, the kind of um, this money can struggle between good and, and, and bad to damage the uh, the institutions, which the old conservatives were very keen to protect, which the populist conservatives were very ready to move to a side. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Very interesting. Now it's your time, Mark. The floor is yours. The microphone, Mark. Yeah, no, no, sorry. I, uh, I was just thinking, uh, I, I agreed with all of that. Um, I think it was very interesting. I think I'd just add a couple of things. I'd uh, build on to what Christian said about populist conservatism. I mean, I think this is the issue. Uh, but before that, I do want to under, underline a point uh, that is really important, which is the, the polarization in British society caused by Brexit is, I think, greater than any other single political issue of the uh, last hundred years. Uh, I think you'd really have to go back to Ireland before World War I or, and immediately after World War I to have something that's been quite as divisive as Brexit. It's more divisive than Munich even more divisive than sewers, Thatcherism, maybe, the, uh, with the miners' strike and so forth, but something along those lines. Uh, more divisive even, I think, than Scottish independence and the, the rise of the call for Scottish independence. Uh, I mean, of course, obviously, in Northern Ireland, there was an actual conflict. That's different. But on mainland Britain, I don't think we've had such a divisive issue 
in modern history, it really has divided the country absolutely, uh, and divided families absolutely. No, I, I, I can't, you know, there's a personal reflection, I can't tell you how many intense arguments I've had with my brother. Uh, who I am very close to, but not on this issue. Uh, and one could multiply that uh, by a million different families across the country or 10 million different families across the country. It's been an incredibly divisive uh, issue. And to that extent, I'm not quite sure that the issue has gone away. Uh, it's true it doesn't quite have the media salience that it did, but you know, just today, we have the Sunak government doing its best to try and row back from the commitment to abolish all EU leg legislation currently in British law. And you've got the European Reform Group, i.e. the hardcore Brexiters, basically threatening rebellion within the Con Conservative Party. I nearly said Communist Party. The, the Conservative Party precisely over this issue. It is, it's being seen as a betrayal within uh, not to do it. So this is why... Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, despite the fact he himself was an enthusiastic uh, member, supporter of British membership of the European community, and I believe I'm right in saying he even called for a second referendum, which I personally, incidentally, always opposed. I, I mean, my small way. I, I think the second referendum was the general election of 2019, rightly or wrongly. It was the right way to solve it by traditional constitutional means. But the uh, Sir Keir Starmer, who was an enthusiastic supporter of British membership in the in uh, during the process of leaving the community, is extremely cautious, as uh, Christian rightly said. Uh, you know, Labour's slogan is "Make Brexit work," but there's increasing evidence that Brexit's not working. On the other hand, he seems unable or unwilling to go that extra step and start. Uh, throwing into doubt the settlement that, that was reached. I mean, who knows what he will do if he wins power. Uh, and that's because he's afraid, right? He really is afraid that it could ignite working class opinion in the so-called red wall seats without which he can't win. Uh, it's really a political question. But the biggest impact, I think, I mean, the question was on UK party politics. Now, I underline the word party, and, and Christian's quite right. The biggest thing that Brexit has done is turn the Conservative Party, which was the party of one nation. Uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration. And, it, and it, under Margaret Thatcher, it began to take on a more overtly right-wing, laissez-faire, neoliberal position. But uh, Mrs. Thatcher, of course, herself was deposed by the Conservative Party, not only, but largely because of her position on Europe. The Conservative Party has been the mainstream establishment party. Uh, it's, it sees itself as a party of government. It's been in government 51 years since 1945. Most British prime ministers of the 20th century were Conservatives. The Conservative Party loves power. The Brexiters are willing to push that to the limits to split the party, to demand, as Christian rightly said, demand more and more bread to be thrown to the crocodiles. This was exactly their strategy uh, in 2019, which, as Christian rightly says, was an incredible constitutional year for us. I mean, it was it was a year-long constitutional crisis. I, 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 I found myself spoiling uh, a course that I taught, which was based on British history, trying to interpret, because I could not talk about anything other than Brexit. Uh, because of the sheer scale of the crisis that we were, were facing. Now, this shift of the Conservative Party uh, towards a more populist form of understanding of its role within politics, of the British, its, uh, the role of the British state, etc., is a major shift, I think, in British politics. Uh, and it represents something completely new. Thatcher had a populist element to her, but at the end of the day, she represented traditional forms of conservatism, uh, albeit in a new guise. Uh, 
the, the populist conservatism of the European uh, issue has definitely moved the Conservative Party much closer to the American Trumpist right-wing Republican right, and it's a new development. Uh, what does it mean for party politics? It, the interesting thing is, uh, is that the party systems remain pretty much intact. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the three parties are Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrats, that's not changed. You could add support among the young for the Greens. In Scotland, of course, there are the Scottish Nationalists. Uh, Farage's Brexit party uh, was a flash party, no? It had an enormous breakthrough on a single issue question in 2019 in the European parliamentary elections, but it didn't uh, ever uh, transform itself I mean, it's now called Reform UK with a slogan, let's make Britain great. And again, you can see the African influence of this. Uh, but the Reform UK is not something that can substitute conservatives because the conservatives have moved right and occupied the space for that kind of what you might describe as extreme British nationalism. Were the Conservative Party to split... But the Conservative Party, I think, can't split, no matter how tense things uh, get over other questions and not just Brexit, because if they do, they will hand victory either to the Labour Party or to a Lib Labour uh, coalition, which is the most likely government in Britain to try in some form or other to rejoin the European community, or at any rate, certainly to greatly improve relations with the European community. So we've got a really rather interesting uh, party system in Britain right now. Uh, we've got a Conservative Party, which is in power, but totally divided. A Labour Party that's uh, divided uh, over a whole host of things, uh, not least about whether or not it should ally with the Liberal Democrats. Uh, we don't really have a centre, and we have a... Uh, all kinds of new issue parties. The Green Party has just done very well in the local elections. And, of course, we have nationalists. Nationalists in England, nationalists in Ireland, nationalists in Scotland, nationalists in Wales. I think one of the things, if I could just throw one other thing in, and to come back to the question about uh, Englishness and Brexit, one of the things that really struck me about the 2016 referendum was if you look at the map of the counties that voted to remain, Scotland, obviously, had many counties that voted to remain, right? It was the Celtic fringes, but also in Wales, the, the, the counties where there is a majority of Welsh speakers voted to remain. In Ireland, uh, the, Catholic uh, the, the counties where there's a Catholic majority voted to remain. And... Uh, so to that extent, there's a juxtaposition with English nationalism. But as, I, as I'm saying, English nationalism will not by itself bring the Conservatives to power. The Conservatives are managed by their anti-establishment policy simultaneously to leave the European Union and to call their dominance as the predominant party in Britain, as the party of the British establishment, into question. On the other hand, it's not obvious what substitutes it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, uh, now let's change our perspective. Um, there is much talk about uh, uh, the problem UK face um, following uh, uh, its withdrawal from the European Union. But uh, it seems to me, and of course not only to me, that Brexit can also be a, a problem for the European Union especially in these times, in times of uh, um, crisis and conflicts, uh, military conflicts, geopolitical crisis, and also uh, international upheaval. Um, so I would like to hear your opinion about this. That is the, the, the impact that Brexit um, had in, for the European Union. Um, Mark, I give you the floor. Okay. Uh... Well, I think, uh, I think both were diminished by it. Um, 
I, I look for a silver lining in Brexit sometimes, but I really can't find one. Uh, I think the EU was diminished, and I think Britain was diminished. I think you can see it just by looking at figures. Uh, the EU today has got a population of 448 million. That's down 12.7% thanks to the exit of uh, the UK, which has a population of 67 million. One can say, okay, that's just population. But, you know, size matters. Matters, I think, in term, economic terms. Uh, the EU's eco EU economy in 2021, I don't have 2022 figures, is 14.5 trillion euro. Well, it would look even more impressive if you added 2.6 trillion, which is the size of the British economy, which uh, in 2021 made it the second largest economy in, in the EU, for the second largest economy to leave the EU, and incidentally, uh, the largest import market for many countries within the EU uh, was not, uh, to put it mildly, uh, a small thing. Uh, the UK has the biggest financial centre in Europe. Uh, this, of course, Frankfurt and Dublin and Paris are also important financial centres. Nevertheless, London is still the largest financial centre in Europe. And indeed, by some measures, Britain is the largest uh, financial services economy in the world. Uh, you know, we're all university professors here. Uh, there is much that is wrong with British higher education, but there's no doubt that there's much that is right with British higher education too. And some of the world's greatest universities are British. This matters in the modern world. Uh, Britain, and this is something which we've not heard much about, and I'm, I've been wondering what would happen to this. Britain is, of course, a permanent member of the uh, United Nations Security Council. I'm actually wondering how that will continue to, to play out, given the choice of Brexit, but that's another matter. The relations with the United States, uh, we can exaggerate the special relationship. The United States has a special relationship with Germany. It has a special relationship with Japan. It has a special relationship with Israel. <laughs> at any rate, at elite, elite level, traditionally, the special relationship with Britain has probably been the closest of them all. Uh, I think one of the paradoxes of Brexit is that I think Britain was probably uh, the few EU countries, perhaps the only EU country, actually, that could have left the EU without catastrophe for itself. Uh, so to Britain, to, that, to, to lose a country that is capable of standing alone, albeit in impoverished and chaotic form, uh, is, is, I think, uh, something that must weigh heavily on the EU. Uh, now, so all those things are, are true. Um, I think that these things are damaging the EU to lose, you know, its joint second most important country. I think Germany is clearly primus inter pari, but France and Germany, I think, are, France and Britain are clearly, were clearly joint second, so to speak. Uh, in terms of their weight in the global economy, political power, uh, the, the extent to which they counted in the world. Of course, there are other countries, Poland, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, which are also very important. But nevertheless, they were the big three. To lose one of the big three is unquestionably weak in the EU. I would add, though, uh, you know, we're talking, you, you said in your question, Daniele, uh, that we're talking about a time of global tension and crisis. Uh, I think, despite the fact that Britain has left, the European Union potentially is uh, an important political actor in the world. But it seems to, in my opinion, uh, and we've had this, uh, this discussion, as you know, many times, it does seem to me that the European Union finds it very hard to shake off the role of being a civilian power to use the expression that was coined, coined by Francois Duchesne in the early 1970s and by Hedley Bull, the British IR theorist. Uh, you know, if we look at the world right now, or indeed, if we just look at our neighborhood, 
those of us who live in continental Europe. And look at, obviously, what's happening in Ukraine, which is a neighbor. Look at what's happening in Turkey. Look at what's happening in North Africa. Look at uh, outside of our neighborhood and look at the potential global conflict between the United States and China over Taiwan. Look at the domestic turmoil in American politics and the possibility that America will not provide us with a kind of security umbrella. Uh, I have to say that it's really not clear what Europe ultimately stands for, except that ultimately most of its leaders would seem to prefer remaining a civilian power. And I don't think, it, and this is, I think, paradoxically one aspect of Brexit. I think in the case of Brexit, uh, Britain, as usual, were being vainglorious. The idea of global Britain is nonsense. The idea that Europe needs to have an improved stance, let's use a euphemism, on global international uh, global international inter, on international politics on in, uh, in international politics is simply a fact uh, and i think in this respect uh, brexit's only highlighted the eu's wider weakness in this area in my opinion okay mark thank you very much for your clear answer uh, and now i give the floor to christian for his um, response christian Sometimes um, politics is something very practical and you have very limited resources in government. So, you, know, you need to focus your resources on what really is important to you and you can't afford to be distracted. And last year, the chief of staff of Theresa May, Gavin Barville, published a um, biographic account of the time of the era of the three years of, of Theresa May. And he said, we, there was so much we wanted, good we wanted to do, but we were constantly distracted by the subject of negotiating with the European Union and uh, uh, our backbenchers who put pressure on us. So, uh, you know, you think government is a big institution and then kind of, it's very limited. And if you, if you think about what the European Union or Britain can do elsewhere, in collaboration and elsewhere, they need to focus and concentrate on that. And in the immediate aftermath of Brexit, there, there was a lot of distraction um, because of uh, some mutual reciprocal bickering. If you think, for instance, of um, the, the 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 British didn't want didn't want to give um, ambassadorial status to the representative of the European Union in London, um, so. It's minor, but it's a distraction. Think about the debates in the British Parliament and in the Conservative in the governing party about sending a gunboat to Gibraltar. Because now, since we're not a member of the European Union, Spain would like to rethink about the status of Gibraltar. Um, in the past, the European Union had to have sort of an equal, equal distance relationship between Spain and Britain and their demands, so it wasn't on the agenda. Now it could be. So they said, send, send, send a gunboat and remind them we can defend the um, the rock. Um, very similar talk about the um, the standoff and the blockade of Jersey by a French fisherman who weren't given they weren't issue, uh, issued with um, licenses to to to. Um, use the fish stock in the area so they were blockading the the island again there was talk about sending the royal navy and sending off the so chasing off the french and and if if you had that kind of last summer uh, during the um, very high profile uh, campaign on who will be the new prime minister of of the uk uh the the, the eventual winner of that race Liz Truss, was asked about the relationship with france are the french our friends or enemies now, I grew up in Germany. First of all, the question wouldn't ask, be asked. And secondly, it would be a foregone conclusion. You wouldn't even think about saying it's it's friends. And even if you think they're not friends, you'd say they're friends. But Liz Truss would say, um, oh, the, the jury is out. We'll see whether they're friends or foes. And that is that is a huge distraction. And if you want to work together, and I understand 
On the British side, Boris Johnson made it always clear, no matter how harsh the relations were, he you know, bent over backwards to call the Euro our European partners and our European friends and you know, defense matters. There had always been an effort on the British side to think about you know, collaborating with the, uh, the European side outside any formal structures, which the British never wanted to enter into with their, their European partners. Um, and and uh, if the, the same is true, if the, the, the British effort and help and support in Ukraine and elsewhere is appreciated, one needs to focus on the collaboration and not on what divides the two sides. The positive note is uh, we have a very pragmatic prime minister right now. And the Windsor Accord was a sign that they want to get things agreed and not uh, look at where the, the divisions are. Um, but whether that, that stays between now and the and the general elections, we don't know because uh, Rishi Zunak will have to uh, keep an eye on his backbenchers, who are not the very best friends of um, our European partners and friends. Um, and and then there's global global sort of Britain, which I'm sure is int of interest to to NATO, to our best American allies, to the Europeans. That Britain made it absolutely clear during the Brexit campaign we want to play an international role, and I think they sent a frigate to the South China Sea to say this is uh, we we are we are involved internationally. But clearly, you need money to finance that. And I'm not going to through this because I don't have the the time now. But if you look at the the hit the British economy take and uh, independent. Um, so economists would say part of that is to do with uh, a hit to British trade, uh, in part it is to the status of the financial services industry in London, uh, in part it is to do with uh, businesses who don't want to invest in Britain because they're afraid they may not get full uh, frictionless access to the European market, so they rather invest in Spain, Portugal, France or Germany. Uh, so, so Britain now without Brexit would have had um, that's a UK in a changing Europe, a think tank saying we had would have 25% higher uh, level of international inward investment. If you don't have the money, it's much harder to have this international role. And just the last note, perhaps, someone told me, I don't know anything about international relations, that if you want to project international power, you need an aircraft carrier. And if you, it, it's, it's an, anecd an anecdote, and it is something that makes one sort of almost laugh or cry, depending which side you're on, that Britain wanted to, sort of, they commissioned a few years ago two aircraft carriers, and halfway through, they were bickering over they had the money to buy the aircraft, and whether they would share the aircraft carrier with the French. So you'd see this Britain that's having this um, review on that support projecting the global Britain role, their status, they're clinging on with two fingers to, to that status and they they struggle to keep it. And they've, they spent 2% of GDP on, on defense and they wanted to increase 2.5%. And that would be a great contribution to NATO and any European efforts. But Britain is economically struggling and people want to shorten the waiting list for the NHS and they want uh, pay rises and you can spend the pound only once. And if it's not there, you can certainly not spend it on defense, which is something which everyone I think in Europe agrees, Britain could make a huge contribution if they have the funding to do so. Thanks. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, I, I, I would just chip in. Uh, it, it does make you want to cry that a country can be so grandiose in its rhetoric and so lacking in the resources to follow through on the rhetoric. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, Mark. And uh, thanks to both of you for these very interesting answers. They, you, you have been able to give us a, a very interesting and uh, clear and stimulating overview uh, on Brexit and uh, and some of uh, its main uh, um, historical and long-term origins, uh, impact, and, uh, and it was very, very interesting and, and stimulating. Um, now we have three, four, perhaps five minutes for questions and answers. And I strongly invite the audience and my colleagues to pose their questions to Mark and or Christian as they are the right men to answer questions on this issue. Yeah. They, they showed us all their knowledge about Brexit and not only Brexit. And I think that this is a good opportunity for all of you to, to uh, um, deepen your knowledge on this topical issue that concerns Great Britain, but also, also us as Europeans, of course. Are there questions?
Well, just one question, uh, uh, a very short one. Uh, um, um, it is quite clear, I think, that uh, there is, uh, uh, I don't, perhaps a widespread sense of uh, feeling of regret in Great Britain for 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 this for this uh, um, for Brexit. Um, um, do you think that this feeling of of uh, uh, regret for this uh, um, for the British withdrawal can can be absorbed and represented by um, the British political parties can can be a, a major issue in the in the um, British debate political debate. Mark, I don't know who wants to go first. Whether Christian, Mark, uh, please. I mean, that's a, a really intelligent question, Daniela, senza, senza falsa lusinga. Um, it's uh, a really interesting question. You know, is Brexit enough to live by? I think the answer has been clearly proved that it's not already, uh, perhaps sooner than some people anticipated. I don't think myself there's any appetite in Britain for nationalism, by which I mean it's paradoxical this because we have Scottish nationalists who are progressive nationalists, however, Welsh nationalists uh, who are very much defending language and trying to keep the prices of houses down, and I don't blame them. Uh, English nationalism, let's just leave it to English nationalism at the moment. It's what Christian was saying before. The Brexit solution that we got was an extremist solution, which was pushed through as a result of certain anomalies of the British constitutional system by a small ma majority of a minority party, namely the Conservatives. And I don't think there's an appetite for nationalism in Britain. There's not a national, an appetite for this populist conservatism, for this American style nationalist conservatism in Britain for a majority of the population, in my opinion. I might be wrong. I don't live in Britain anymore, but I do go back to Britain regularly. All my family ties are in Britain. I keep myself up to date on what's happening in Britain. Uh, I don't like what's happened to the Conservative Party, but if they carry on with English nationalism, I think Mr. Sunak is right in trying to be more pragmatic because if he loses the center ground, they're finished. So to that extent, there is hope. On the other hand, uh, the Brexit debate, I think, showed that Britain would not be able to re-enter the European, community, European Union without great difficulty. Because if re-entering the EU were to mean adopting the Euro, if it were to mean uh, very large budget contributions, if it were to mean, I think, anything more than being part of the single market uh, and maybe the customs union, I don't know how any British government could sell that to, to the British people without igniting some kind of, uh, yet again, all the, the, the culture wars surrounding uh, Brexit. And, and I think this is why Mr. Starmer is being so cautious, and I think he's right to be cautious, frankly, uh, in talking about making Brexit work, about increasing links. In effect, the Conservatives and the Labour Party are following the same policy, but are not, uh, but are emphasising minor dif differences for the sake of parliamentary politics. But if you look at it closely, both the, the leadership of the Conservative Party, Mr. Sunak, is moving very, very close to what the Labour Party is being advocating uh, for, for since, 20, since 2020. And I think, uh, sorry, I'm giving you a long answer here, but it was a really good question, and, and, and I, I want to get this point across. So how do, how do you resolve this problem? I, I continue to think that some sort of, I, I personally believe that some sort of lead must come from uh, the EU. And it should be along the lines of variable geometry. It should be along the lines of uh, uh, multi-tiered Europe, 
uh, the kind of things that uh, the German Christian Democrats proposed back in the 1990s, and they were right to. Uh, I've always felt, always felt, uh, paradoxically, because uh, the dreaded F word, federalism, was associated with it, that something that like what Joska Fischer proposed uh, to, in 2000, 23 years ago, almost to the day, uh, would have made far more sense for Europe than uh, the, uh, the approach of one of trying everybody moving together towards the Lisbon Treaty that was eventually, and a constitution and then the Lisbon Treaty, which was actually introduced. Britain is, if Britain had been tree, if been, Britain had been able to be in the single market and the customs union and been essentially like Norway, we would still be, we would have the same kind of relationship that Norway has with the European Union today, and British politics domestically would be a much better place for it. You would never have been able to mobilize even the tabloids, even the Daily Mail would never have been able to mobilize Mr. Farage and Mr. Johnson and so forth into a gigantic nationalist political force if it hadn't been the possibility to talk about the Fourth Reich, to talk about the European superstate and so forth, and, and which the constitutional process, I think, uh, made possible. Uh, I've always been convinced of this. Some form of variable geometry was probably necessary back in the 1990s. And I think as a way of uh, attracting Britain closer to Europe uh, and making the relationship so much better, making it from the economic point of view more rational, so Christian can send his, uh, his parcels across borders. I mean, I know exactly what he means because I have the same problem. I think it's absolutely necessary that from the EC side comes some sort of creative thinking about, uh, but of course the risk for Europe is, the risk for the EU is that there are quite a lot of countries in within the EU which might themselves rather like a kind of satellite status being in the in 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 the uh, in the core, it, being outside the core, but without uh, but still within the single market. I don't know. I haven't got a solution to that, but I think some form of uh, opening from Europe is necessary if people in Britain who continue to support the ideal of European integration, I am certainly one of them, are to be able to win the internal debate. If it becomes you join Europe, if you want to jo rejoin Europe, you've got to become a member on everybody at the same terms as everybody else, then Britain will never rejoin Europe. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Uh, there, are, there are two questions, very, very complicated questions. And I and I ask you, uh, I trust on your ability. I ask you, uh, uh, cordially ask you to respond in, in three minutes, no more than three minutes. Uh, and the questions are, do you think, uh, I mean, uh, Davide Natalini writes that I have seen the Republican protest to the crowning of King Charles. Do you think this had been exacerbated? by Brexit or rather by the royal family dramas. Uh, and the second question is, uh, again, from David and Nadalini, what was the impact of Brexit on the Commonwealth? One can write a book on this, on this question, of course. And because of this, I ask you to, 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 um, um, to be brief. <laughs> Who wants to respond, Mark or, or Christian? Republican protests. And uh, let's just go first. British Commonwealth. Uh, very, very clever and, and, and interesting questions, of course, but we have just two, three minutes, I think. Nino, uh, how, how many times do we have? Hmm. Well, actually, there's no time left. <laughs> okay. So, so, so uh, be very, very brief, please. Very brief. Thank you. I, I, I think, you know, re, re, regardless of sort of, you, know, you, you can discuss Brexit in any kind of context. You, you, the, the Brits cut off their trade links with the Commonwealth because they were part of a customs union. And you can put in the context of the monarchy, what does that mean? I, I think there's one thing to watch, and that is that uh, very different from uh, many continental Europeans, um, the British see uh, uh, European integration and the European community as something very transactional. So in the future, looking at the future, I think, 
think uh, they will always ask the question, how do we benefit? Uh, and I think if you buy the new uh, uh, Oxford English Dictionary, you find a word that you may not have learned in school is called cakeism. And that is, uh, you, you, you want to keep the cake and eat it at the same time. And that was the kind of uh, terminology used to say, we want the advantage of being a member, but we uh, don't want to have all the responsibilities. And I think, uh, you know what Mark said, it, it really needs to be seen what the European Union will offer in the future for the Brits to say, well, the, these are bits and pieces which we like. And the behemoth of the European Union will not go away. So the debate will there. You look across the channel and you see these are all the appealing things of a common market and we can't have it. But if we want it, then we need to have open borders and micro free, free migration of European citizens. So it will be an ongoing debate and, and perhaps uh, perhaps we'll uh, here in a different sort of different sort of constellation have similar debates again in the future because Brexit won't go away as a debate as long as the European Union is there and is really appealing. The Ukrainians want to be part of it, other Eastern Europeans, and Britain will have to have that on the agenda in the future uh, again. Thank you. Thank you to Mark. Thank you to uh, Christian. It was a real pleasure and it was very, very interesting. Thank you. And, uh, and, and uh, as we have no more time, I, I give the floor to, to Nino Galetti for his concluding remarks. I just wanted Thank to you. say something about British Republicanism, but that's fine. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, go on. Go on, go on. Uh, I don't know how to what extent that was uh, uh, in any way created by Brexism, but there's no doubt that there is uh, the 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 notion of British nationalism is bound up with the crown. But the difference, I think, is notice the adjective British nationalism as opposed to English nationalism. Now, I. Uh, which is the, very much what the Conservatives have been into in recent years. I uh, speak as one of the very few uh, British Republicans, so it's not really for me uh, to say. But uh, on the second question about the Commonwealth, uh, this should not be underestimated. In Britain, I don't know how much the, con the Commonwealth means for the elites of India and Nigeria and Australia and Canada and so forth, but it does mean a lot for the British establishment. And British, the British press, British intellectuals take a lot of interest. It's always struck me, for example, living in Italy, that when India, the world's largest democracy, has a, 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 an election, you can find it on page 12 or whatever of the newspapers. Whereas in, in Britain, it's always for front page news. And there's a reason for this. There is a genuine uh, interest in the countries of the Commonwealth. And in fact, the, almost the Queen's last act before, before her death was to ensure that the Commonwealth uh, passed on the leadership of the Commonwealth to then Prince, now King Charles, to retain the sense of the royal family being at the head of an international organization. I, I, I don't know how widely felt the, com the Commonwealth is within Britain among, among ordinary British people. Among British elites, the Commonwealth is taken very seriously. Thank you. As for the Republican sentiments, let me say that the attention the Italian newspapers gave to the royal crown, to the royal family, shows that the royal family is more popular in Italy than in England, perhaps. Uh, so thank you, thank you to both of you for the, for your for your interventions and comments. And now, now I give the floor to Nino Galetti for his concluding remarks. So thank you. As we have no time anymore, I just want to thank all of you, uh, especially Mark Gilbert and Christian Schnee for the interventions. Very very interesting, and I hope to see you soon again. Uh, in this format or in another one. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you.